What's up, guys? Okay, so we did get a decent amount of feedback asking for more color science-y things. So we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into a topic that we've already covered, um, mostly to do with luminance versus brightness. Okay, now we're going to go a little bit deeper into it today. But first, two disclaimers. Number one, I am very much a color science student. Um, I'm not an expert. Didn't go to college for anything that I do because I didn't go to college at all. I don't have any accreditations. I don't have any certifications. I don't have any Asians of any kind. <laughs> I just like to do this. I researched it. Um, when I need to figure something out, I dig deep and I try to find resources. Obviously, it's been easier since the internet, but I've been at this about 30 years. So, you know, what I'm going to tell you, hopefully, has more to do with how it can apply to being a photographer using Photoshop. But this leads me to point number two or disclaimer number two, color science is well beyond Photoshop. Color science has to do with developing hardware for um, all kinds of camera systems. Uh, it has to do with video production, it has to do with color management and production teams. Color science is a big open point that's more to do than just, than just adjustment layers in Photoshop. Adjustment layers in Photoshop just simply leverage the idea of color science. I also want to throw in real quick that we're going to talk about some things that have to do with human perception, which is why, in my opinion, when we say things like color theory, right, which, you know, that has to do with anything. It can be the way you paint your walls uh, with physical paint. It doesn't have to be in the digital space. But color theory, the reason why it's called theory is for the same reason we call music theory, music theory. And that's because we're talking about human perception. Human perception varies human to human. We also can't see what another human sees. Now, color blindness aside, which can be determined with testing, right? Color blindness aside or other type of optical sort of biological issues um, aside, humans see things relatively the same way based on tests and research that's way beyond me. But what we're trying to do with digital imaging in general, what it's been trying to do since the dawn of digital imaging is try to create something that's perceptually accurate to what we're used to seeing. Because at the end of the day, everything on this screen is an illusion, right? Okay, with all of that said, let's dive a little bit into luminance versus brightness. Now, if you want to get technical, luminosity technically can be referred to as the luminous perceptual energy. And that has to do with how we see a certain hue in black and white, in, a, in grayscale, right? And that gives us an idea of the intensity, right? Now, biologically speaking, humans tend to be more sensitive, radically more sensitive to greens. Now, when I say greens, I actually kind of mean more into the yellows. Make it real clear. If ever you've done any type of nature photography or a shot with a bunch of green leaves and green foliage, you probably experience that when you go to modify or target the greens, you're not really targeting the greens. You have to use the yellow, usually somewhere in that range. Okay, so it kind of spreads further than pure green, further than the pure hue angle of 120, which is green, right? So we know that it's going to be somewhere in the yellows. We're less sensitive to red and really less sensitive to blue. Now, what I've shown before in other videos, if we take a 50% gray layer like we have right here, put it on color blend mode, boop, this is kind of a default luminosity and it's pretty darn accurate. And although I don't know, it's probably based on Rec. 709 and sRGB luminance values or luminance coefficients. Now, real quick, let's talk about that for a second. Recommendation 709 came out, I think, in 1990, and it had to do with video. I think it might have to do with the first HD video standards. And it has to do with color per, uh, luminosity perception in humans so they can replicate that accurately. Because remember, everything on the digital screen is fake. It's a simulation. And again, it can go really into the weeds. I am not an engineer in any of that stuff. I just know what it means to me here. Okay, so taking a 50% gray layer, putting it on color, extract the color information, and then you only see the luminance. So what do we see? We see that the yellow greenish is the brightest that has the most luminous perceptual energy to our eyes. Red is somewhere in between. And then uh, blue is, of course, the darkest. All right, there's a little bit of math behind that too when it comes to specifically Rec. 709. There's luminance coefficients, right? Or percentages. And they are as follow. Red, the coefficient is 0 0.2126 or 21.26%. Green is 0 0.7152 or 71.52%, and blue is 0.0722, or just 7.22%, okay? And that, again, is the luminous perceptual energy. And by the way, if you add all those numbers up, you get 100, 100%, that's the whole point. So we're talking about specifically R, G, and B, because that's how we create the colors in the digital world, right, on the screen. All right, all that aside, what could that possibly mean for you? Well, that's gonna be up to you. We're just gonna talk about the perception 
and do some demos to kind of give you an idea of why it works the way it works. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about the first one. This is a black and white uh, adjustment layer and it is at maximum luminance contribution. Okay, well, it, used to, it should be anyway. Let's put it on maximum white, which means all the luminance contribution of every single hue is going to be 100. When I turn that on, everything turns white. This is going back to our demo, right? All right, so we can take red and take it down. And you probably can guess what happens if I put red on zero. It's black, see? So we are changing the luminosity perception with our black and white adjustment layer, which is why things, presets like maximum black and maximum white appear. And these are interesting and can be very useful for cool calculations and whatnot when you're doing different blend modes to extract certain things. Useful for a photographer trying to make pretty pictures? Probably not, but still kind of cool. So this is what we call brightness data. This is 100% luminance contribution uh, of every single hue. And of course, it's all white. This is the default gray as we talked about. But when we open up a black and white adjustment layer in Photoshop for the first time, it is on these default settings that probably we've asked, what are they? Why are they there? Why aren't they down the middle? This is sort of a quasi luminance perception. You notice that if I turn it off and turn the gray one on, the gray um, solid color layer, they are similar, but not quite. Okay, this is the first kind of point I want to make. Luminosity or again, luminous perceptual energy can vary and you can play that to your advantage depending on the edit that you're trying to do and how you're trying to work it out. But there is a semi-standard, I want to call it that, because it does vary and there are different ones. I mentioned Rec 709, there's Rec 2020, I think there's something called Rec 2100 um, and they move, this has to do mostly with uh, video and television, but these these standards are, are created as more as technology advances, right? Most of us, when we get excited about new television screens or new displays, we talk about gamut, we talk about range, right? And that's cool, okay? But the luminosity coefficients, the, how we determine luminous perceptual energy has to do with our brains. So no matter how much gamut we get, our brains are still gonna perceive luminosity a certain way, right? And that's what these calculations and all this science stuff is for. Now, another way we can get luminance is the channel mixer. We turn on the channel mixer and put it on monochrome. You see these figures right here that I typed into R, G, and B? This is exactly what I just mentioned. This is loosely based on the Rec 709 luminance coefficients or the percentages, the how much luminance contribution these things are giving, right? So the numbers don't completely add up to 100 for a couple of reasons. One, I think this looks halfway okay, even though it's pretty radically different. And two, we can't type in percentages, excuse me, decimals into these percentages on the channel mixer. But it's another way of dealing with luminance, right? Now, you might think, who cares? And I agree. Who cares? <laughs> the idea here is to understand why this happens. And I know the calculations and the math can be like, why would I ever need to do this when I'm editing? You wouldn't. But let's talk about another demo to give you an idea of perception. Now, before I go into this demo, I want to mention my third disclaimer. I'm going to give you a demo that should be pretty accurate. But here's the deal. You talk about color science. When I let you see this, I have converted all of it to video, a specific format, a specific color space, and I've uploaded it to YouTube and God knows what YouTube does to it. So there already I am inaccurate. I am trying to, to <laughs> explain a demonstration, explain some differences when, that I'm looking at on my screen right here, which will not be accurate to what I upload. That's again, another color science, color management concern. Now for the most part in the modern era, Things have gotten pretty accurate and pretty easy. And one of the reasons why is that developers of all this technology have tried to make it as seamless as possible so humans can use these tools to make things and make pretty things and have to fight with color management. 25 years ago, it was a huge issue. When you sent something to print, it was a digital file, like a, a photo, and you're going to send it to a die sub printer or something like that. Color management was a nightmare. All your blues turned purple constantly. It was a huge trick. Never mind, you know, exact uh, halftone screening and, and resolution that you need, et cetera, et cetera. Over time, these technologies have evolved to make things simpler for us so we can develop and make things look cool. But with that said, let's talk about this demo. Okay, so I have a square within a square and I'm hoping that this is <laughs> perceivable on the video, okay? Let me explain what's happening here. This background square is perfect red, zero hue angle, 100% saturation, 100% brightness, okay? The square in the middle, is 10 degrees, okay, off of red. So it's a little more orange, but still 100% saturation, 100% brightness. 
I can see it. It looks clear to me. It's obviously uh, orange square inside a red square. Okay. Now, if I take this hue, um, hue and saturation layer above and I shift the hue angle negative 120, now I get blue. The red turns to blue and the middle square turns to 10 degrees off of blue. I can still see it. There's a square within a square. Sweet. If I take another adjustment layer on top, hue and saturation, and another negative 120, this will give me green. Turn it on. They're, they're, they're the same. Why are they the same? They're actually not. They're just so similar. Why? Because the way our brain, our eyes, are sensitive to green. This is a lot of luminous perceptual energy hitting us in the face. And because of that, the differences in those two squares is very, very difficult to perceive. Okay, we can actually illustrate that better without the pain of neon colors in our eyes when we turn on the gray luma layer, which is a basic Photoshop way of calculating luminance at a default setting, probably based on Rec. 709. We turn that on. Look at that. Our reds are very different. Okay, because our eyes are somewhat sensitive to that, right? Blues, we're not very sensitive to that, so the differences stick out. I know it might sound con contradictory. We're not sensitive, so the difference sticks out. It has to do with the energy or the radiance that's coming off of it. It's not as intense, so our eye is calmer with it, right? And if we turn on the green, everything's a little brighter. This is the luminance energy I'm talking about. Look how much different it is from blue. These are dark grays. These are bright grays. Now you can see the square in the middle, but you can see how similar they are. When you actually add the color energy to them, they vanish. And yes, I'm sitting here on my screen and it's, I have to squint, but I can see the difference in the square. Now, that's another thing too. Apart from how this video ends up looking um, on YouTube after I export it and do the things that I do, there's also a difference. Like I could take this exact demo file, put it on someone else's computer. Maybe they're running a really high-end display as opposed to my MacBook Pro default laptop screen and they see something slightly different as well. This is why color management, color science is a thing because of all these variables in production, okay? This is all a simulation, all of it. Everything on the screen is a simulation, like I mentioned. Because of that, we have to, ha we have to manage it. Someone has to. Really, really smart engineers have done this for decades to allow us to make pretty pictures. So that was a little bit of a deep dive. I, I know it probably didn't provide any information to make you a better editor, but it gives you an idea of what we're dealing with when it comes to hue and luminance, which is, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, lesson one. <laughs> All right, that was a super fast demo. Again, if you have any questions, leave a comment below. And if you want to talk more about this stuff, we definitely can. If you yourself are an expert on color science, if this is what you do for a living or you're an engineer in this, we'd love to talk to you. If you want, we can even set up an interview or do a live stream because there's interest out there in this sort of thing amongst photographers who do um, you know, retouching. Okay. People who make pretty pictures. I'm not downplaying that. I'm just want to make it very clear again, as I close this one out, you can be an incredible photographer with a great vision and great methodologies for retouching and not know a damn thing about color science. You don't need to know this to make pretty pictures. However, to some people, it kind of, it creates a little extra spark of something and it can even lead to inspiration. Um, oftentimes technology for me, new tech or understanding of a new, of an existing tech, excuse me, understanding of an existing tech can cause me to get inspired by something. And then it leads me to a, a new approach. So you never know. Everyone's different. Some people will never care about any of this. Other people like me nerd out on it and some people make a living on it. So any questions, leave us a comment below and uh, we will continue. Oh, oh, real quick before I go, actually, we are going to have some more I don't want to say typical because it downplays it some more, um, uh, you know, tutorial type things uh, explaining different functions and methods that we do for retouching really cool stuff to make those pretty pictures. But we're going to pepper it with some color science like we're doing today. And if you have any more questions, like I said, drop us a comment below.